So today, um, Katarina and a, a boy named Sue did a really good job of, of doing the quality control analysis stuff. So I'm kind of kind of breeze through that. Um, but obviously, array, and that, that's another thing I want to stress, is that array analysis takes a lot of time. If you want to get a lot out of your array data, you, you have to immerse yourself. If, if you think you're going to do it in an afternoon, it's not going to happen. At least if you're going to do a good interpretation of the array analysis. So basically, I'm going to go over some things. Is it even worth actually analyzing the data? And from there, if, if this is all good, using bioinformatics or biological connectivity to help guide your analysis, and this is kind of my own thing, is to justify some of the methods you use, back, different background techniques, different st st uh, st statistical uh, programs. And this is probably one of the underutilized aspects of array analysis, is using other people's data and incorporating that into yours, using other people's data to compare to yours to strengthen your conclusions or to disqualify hypothesis. And then at the very end, I'll, as long as time, I got till 11.20, is that right, Chris? Yep. And if I have some, and basically until the end of the time, I'll, I'll go over some examples from my own work uh, of, of how I've analyzed and, and give you examples of, of all these things that I talk about. So futility. If you have a poorly designed experiment, it doesn't matter how much you analyze it, chances are it's, you're not going to get anything out of it. So obviously, you spend a lot of time analyzing your data. Uh, what you want to do is make sure that it's even worth it. So the aspects of this, obviously, experimental design. Is the, is the experiment actually designed correctly? Have you accounted? for all the variables inherent in your, in your particular experiment. Uh, also, we, we're dealing with issues with quality control. Is the data actually good? I mean, is it something that you, you want to look at? And we've, I give you certain ways to, to check that. And then it says statistical uh, significance and power. You know, do you have enough numbers of samples to actually see real differences? And if so, using statistical analysis, can you determine if there's actually do you have a good chance of actually seeing something different between the, the, the systems that you're studying? OK, so let's just start. This is just a very basic uh, general, uh, general example here. You have a human tissue biopsies. You have 10 tumors versus 10 controls. So this is, let's say this is a lung biopsy, right? And, and you have malignant versus benign. How about that? OK. <laughs> and I'm glad you said this. Age. Every array study that I actually look into, this is a huge factor. And no one really pays attention to that. If you're dealing with subjects with different ages, this, you will be able to see that in the expression profiles. And so you have to account for that. If you don't want to see this, then you have to age match your subjects. Uh, the gender, race, smoking history, medications, and again, cell types can all play a role. And the more that you can minimize it to see the effects of the disease, the stronger your array study will be. And if you can't, and I know this happens, that you can't, you can't get these variables out. And I will try, I'll show you ways that you can potentially get these variables out of your array study so you can see the effect of the cancer itself. And again, sample processing. If you have a different technician that's processing, this, processing the tissues, you will probably see that in the array results. Uh, different lot numbers of reagents. Some reagents are, more, are, are fresh, more fresh than the others. And so that in a different lot, you know, we, we, we might see effects there. The enzymes might work better. Time of processing, again, you mentioned that, Eric, is huge. Um, that, that your ability to take the tissue and fix it, you, you have a very small window, and that that the time away from that can, can play a huge role. RNA degrades. So the difference between 10 minutes after you take that biopsy versus 30 can be quite big. And again, we've talked about array processing here, technicians, reagents. You know, basically what this all comes down to, 
or the big underlying theme is you always want to randomize or balance your samples and process together whenever possible, right? You don't want to do all your controls at one time and then do all your experimentals at others. If, if it's going to take you a while for your experimental set to be ready, your mice to, to sacrifice them, store your tissue from your controls, wait until uh, you, you harvest from your experimental group and process together. Always try to process together. I can never stress this enough. And uh, Sue and uh, Katarina did a pretty good job of this. You know, obviously there's quality control measurements we can take looking at distribution of signal intensities. Uh, same thing here, correlating the different expressions. And obviously all of this is under the assumption that the, most of your e expression between your samples is going to be very similar. That, there's, that, that most of the genes aren't going to change. And so we use this to, to determine what's good and what's bad. But what do you think this is? So this is signal intensity from low to high. And this would be maybe the frequency of that intensity. What do you think this is? Say that, say it again. No, this is actually probably all your absent genes. So remember, we're surveying the entire genome, right? And, it, and any given cell type is not gonna express all its genes, right? So there's gonna be a lot of genes that we, we just don't measure because it's not actually expressed in a, the particular tissue we use. So again, I'm gonna talk about this later, but this would probably be at about four, uh, a signal intensity of four would be, probably be all your absent genes. So another way to check the, whether it's actually worth analyzing our data is PCA plots. And I love PCA plots. Uh, I'm a very visual person. I think this gives you a good check to not only see the consistency, but you can get certain aspects of the data actually comes out once you impose it in three-dimensional space. So if we look here at this study, this is a PBM study of uh, peripheral blood cells of controls people, individuals with Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. What looks odd here? What's that? Yep, exactly. Right? Very good. That you can see everything here is on one particular plane, it looks like. But you've got these controls. They're not even actually in the same kind of three-dimensional area of this one. They're actually down below here. And this is actually somebody else's data. And when I actually went back to the, to the original cell files, sure enough, they did these at a different time. They said, hey, we got some other samples. So we might as well add them to our, our study. And you're getting this huge back, batch effect. So in this case, I wouldn't throw away the study. I would just throw away these guys. Right? I'm looking at consistency. And I know there's a tendency, you know, we've spent $600, you know, or, or $800 to process these chips, you know, times what, how many uh, of these samples are, that, you know, you don't want to just throw away money. But if it compromises your overall array study, I say do it. Okay, and so this PCA study, these are two primary cell lines and one immortalized cell line stimulated with cytokines. So they basically took these cell cultures, split them, uh, stimulated one with cytokines, left the other one untreated, and then harvest after maybe an hour later. So which, one do, which do you think are the primary cell lines, two primary cell lines? And I know you can't, like, yeah, that one. Well, do, do it in your head. Yeah, I mean, you can see this. I mean, that's what's really cool about this. You know, just visually, I can tell the difference between the immobilized cell lines and the, and the two primary cell lines. Not only that, so our reds are controls and the blues are stimulated. Look how that goes, is they all seem to go in the same direction, and that's a great thing. We want to see that, right? What would happen if you did your PCA plot and say this one was red and this was blue? What would you think? Exactly. You know, it's, it's kind of another check. And, and you can do the same thing with the, the copy number or the SNP arrays, is that 
you know, it's very easy, and I think Dr. Baggerly will back me up here, that you, you actually see this a lot. People will confuse samples. And, you know, when you're taking things through many different uh, uh, Excel sheets, things get mixed up to, at times. And so it's good to have this kind of overall check just to make sure, did I do everything right? Did, uh, am I sure I labeled that right? And if I see something like this, I'm, I'm feeling pretty good. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time with this. Power analysis, obviously, you want to use enough samples in order that you're going to see some real differences in when you finally do the analysis. OK. And this is one thing. So the array, all of your experiment, you've, you've controlled for all the variables. Um, uh, quality analysis looks good. Now, do you actually see any real differences in your data? You know, are the two, condi is condition A, condition B actually different than each other, right? And what I like to do is use, basically do a distribution of the p-values, do a histogram of the distribution. So down here would be, this would be zero for the p-value and this would be one. So given these two comparisons, which one would you expect would have more differences or which you would actually want to look at? What's that? Say it again. Left one, yes, correct, right? We have a greater number of p-values at the lower end than we do at the higher end. Actually, in statistical terms, I believe this is called the beta curve, right? That's what you want to see. Here, this just looks like random noise, right? You're not, you know, your distribution of your p-values seems to just be at random. Here, you actually have a trend. And the steeper this beta curve, the more differences that you're probably going to see. Or you can do a kind of a quick and dirty test, and I like to do this a lot of times too. So say we ha we're looking at 35,000 genes. I do a t-test between two conditions at a p-value of less than 0 0.01, and I get 310 transcripts. Is this promising or not so promising? is not promising. <laughs> and I'll tell you why, all right? So we've got 35,000 genes we're looking at, right? We're doing 35,000 individual t-tests. At a probability of 0 0.01, I would expect 350 of these genes to be significant just due to random chance alone, right? You're just basically taking this one, two, 350, 1%. Is that? No, OK. So. I'm getting less than that, what I would predict by random chance. So in this instance, I would say that's a bad sign, okay? Uh, 